All righty. Well, I want to welcome everyone back from Wall Street Silver community. We have an incredible, incredible special guest, John Lee, the chairman of Silver Elephant. He has an incredible experience, 25 years in the silver market. John, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fine. Great to be on your show for the first time. Awesome. Awesome. We're excited to have you. We also have Jim Lewis from the Wall Street Silver community. Jim, do you want to get right into it? Yeah, John, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. I've seen you online before giving some interviews, and we wanted to get your perspective on what's going on in the silver market, the economy, and this extraordinary time we're having right now with what governments are doing. Uh, you have an interesting perspective in that you're involved. Uh, you're, you're located in Canada with your company. You also have roots in, uh, in Asia also. You have a very global perspective, and we thought that would be really interesting to talk to to you. Tell us a little bit of, a little bit about your background uh, and a little bit about what you're doing with Silver Elephant, and let's just get into it. Yeah, hey, thanks, Jim. Um, I I'm a Taiwanese native. I was educated in the UK and in the United States. Traveled over forty countries, uh, being the chairman of Silver Elephant Mining for the last 10 years. And before that, I started my career in the Silicon Valley in the uh, in the late 90s. And then some I retired uh, year 2000. I was very lucky the company I worked for got bought out and uh, had a girlfriend who was from Vancouver, Canada. You cannot be you know, uh, traveling in Vancouver and not getting involved in the mining industry. And interestingly, that was exactly the time when Bank of England dumped that last batch of 250 tons of gold at $250. And, that's how I got into the mining industry. So I turned it from, from, from an investor to becoming a running a mining company because of the 2009 financial crisis where my portfolio was decimated. And uh, so the, I thought it was a hobby to uh, sort of try a running a company and uh, consolidate some assets and all of a sudden become a full-time job. And uh, 10 years later, and you know what, Jim? You, it's like, uh, you know, in 1999, when the Asian financial crisis came, you thought that's the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Then uh, people were back, and then the 2009 financial crisis. You thought it couldn't get anything bigger because the U.S. world's largest economy's mortgage market was on the brisk collapse. And now we're in 2020. Now it's a deja vu to 2009, except on a global scale. It's like you dropped a neutron bomb, right? Literally, with nobody <laughs> on the street. So who knows? Seems like it comes once in a decade. And uh, I wonder what's in store of 2030, and maybe. I was just reading about the World Economic Council about, oh, it's going to be great. You don't have to own anything. Oh, Everything the Klaus, can come the, to you with Klaus a drone. And, well, Jim, somebody has gone, somebody's got to own something. And uh, so, you know what? Maybe we'll see nothing yet. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. <laughs> you're, you're referring to the that Klaus statement. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy, right? And uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd be happy. I mean, I, with uh, I, I'm not that type of personality, and I don't think most of our audiences. We have a lot of silver stackers uh, in our audience. And uh, do you do you stack silver? By the way, you got any? You got any? I own quite silver? a bit of silver. I started yeah. buying was a, was nine dollars. Uh, I started buying around nine. In 2000 and right around 2007 ish, and I've been just adding. I stopped mm -hmm. doing it. And I was when silver was 15. When I started running the company, I said no time. But yeah, I got a few thousand ounces. I don't yeah, exactly I, know how many I have, but uh, I added a couple of uh, more coins just recently, putting a bank deposit and uh, you know sit there, forgot about it. Yeah, well, a lot of a lot of people like to own ounces in the ground. You know, that's you know we have the option of some people prefer physical. I've got some myself. American Silver Eagles, I have uh, bars, but a lot of us like to invest in silver miners, which is the equivalent of, hey, ounces in the ground at a way cheaper price. Uh, well, they're two different things, right, Jim? I think, first yeah. of all, I, I'm a bigger fan of Maple because it's, it's triple nines versus 995, 95 for the Eagles. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Maple is actually a lot smaller. I don't know if you track, if you actually compare it in the size of the coins. And secondly, you know what? I never said about it. Even when silver went to 50, I didn't sell my holdings and it was it was never, it's just always an I mean it's just an afterthought, right? So mining is different. You get up six thirty Pacific, you glue your eyes on the screen, and uh, it's a totally different investment class. Well, you know that's a good point you make that a lot of people didn't sell at fifty um, when it went there back in what was it two thousand eleven or two thousand twelve, yes. and a lot of us who are holders of silver, we're it, it 
when we take silver off the market, it's off the market for decades. It's <laughs> exactly. not coming back on. We're holding for two hundred. We're holding for three hundred dollars an ounce because we recognize the value of silver. And that that sort of leads to my next question of the value of silver economically in industry. And we see this gradual increase in demand industrially for green technologies, for solar. And at the same time, we see supply, global supply in decline. Back in 2016, we maxed out at about 900 million ounces for global mine supply. Yeah. And since then, the mine supply has been trending downwards about 2% per year. In 2020, it, was, it fell from 900 million a few years ago. Now we're down to 800 million ounces a year in global mine production. And I don't think people are quite comprehending. It's, it hasn't penetrated yet that industrial demand, monetary demand, you know, the coins and bars that we put away and we store in vaults, that's crossing and exceeding what global mine supply is. Supply is yes. in decline, demand is increasing. Where do you see... Do you see a tripping point coming where, oh, my God, the world wakes yeah, up? Yeah, you know what, Jim? It's, you can say that about a lot of markets, right? You can substitute the word silver, say, for nickel or for, say, your earth. Um, and well, you're right, silver, so we in care electronics, about <laughs> in, 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 in EVs. While the mine, while the mine supply is, 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 is going down or around steady, I think the total supply of silver from recycling and whatnot is pretty stable at about a billion ounces. Um, I think the key here is the way I, I look at the way I look at silver market or in any market in general, the industrial demand, these people are what I call the price takers. They're very rarely sell in the price setters, in what is the exception of say palladium in the recent times. So what I mean by that is these fundamental demand, industrial demand you see or be setting higher ground, higher price levels for silver. But it's all, but make no mistake about it, for silver is always that speculative demand that's gonna drive the market for. These are the price setters, right? Mm -hmm. Not the price takers. Price takers, as soon as price go up, they, they, they hold back, they look for substitutes and alternatives. Mm -hmm. But for investors, <laughs> the more price going up, the more you buy. <laughs> and these are, like you said, you buy the physical, you forget about it. And these are the blue and the red pills, right? And as all of a sudden you get the horde of new investors discover silver and they go all in like all of us and there's no turning back. <laughs> so it's it, so for these looking for actions or forecasts of silver, it's, it's always that investment demand that will drive that market. But the fundamental the industrial demand also play a key part around 30, around sort of 50, 60 percent. These are price takers and you look for them to set higher, what I hold, call the higher lows for silver going forward. John, are you invested in any cryptocurrencies or do you what is your outlook on cryptos, John? Yeah, I was just had another interview earlier, um, earlier today. There's a lot of parallel investors in both um, cryptos and silver. Um, I first heard about crypto because I'm a I'm from Rice. I have a computer engineering degree. I thought it's a noble concept, and it's kind of kind of like a it's kind of vegetarian meat, but it's not the real meat, you know, in a way for metals. That's a good way. And to explain that it started it was fifteen dollars an ounce, a, a coin for Bitcoin when it at the very start, maybe five four years ago. I am not bullish on crypto, and uh, you know, I would just you know, I put my clock there, so I'm setting it a minute in talking about that. Um, 70% of the cryptocurrency are traded not in fiat, not in dollars or British pound or in euros. They're trading in Tether. And Tether's supply has grown uh, from 5 billion to around 30 billion in the last nine months, coinciding with the rise in Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. And Tether claim, is a stable coin claim to have a, a, a dollar of, of te, a, a US dollar backing every Tether, but there's absolutely no evidence to support that whatsoever. And so there was a there's a lawsuit filed by the District of New York um, for a couple of years, and recently just got, just got settled. And interestingly enough, I'm sure if you look at the Tether's vault supply, all of a sudden it's probably exploded by the billion dollar per week, and that 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 um, that would have a very direct impact on the cryptocurrency, which has gone up 20 percent for 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 um, for for bitcoins. How long? When is going to end? We don't know. It'll end when it's in hindsight, yeah. but but I think it would be interesting to see the volume of ratio of tether versus uh, dollars and whatnot. 
if that ratio change in over time. So, you know, go higher, just like everything else. Uh, but you for, for these guys, I will be watching the exit quite closely. Um, that's my take. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've been watching that also. I, I, that same lawsuit you referred to, the yeah. attorney general in New York, and the result was they got a fine and they're banned. Tether is now banned from doing business in the state of New York, which includes the financial capital of the world, New York City. I just wonder how much of a future, whether there's going to be copycat lawsuits that just further limit the on-ramps for Tether and things like that. But um, Just a real quick note on that. I think we settled for like $40 million for, for $30 billion investigation fraud. So mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody else has probably uh, had... <laughs> Had, uh, but secondly, uh, about the street New York, uh, a lot of the tether transactions are conducted in in in, in Asia and elsewhere, and uh, you know the, the guys getting through by VPN. There's never stopping anybody from. Yeah, it's not going to stop anyone who really wants to do it. But yeah. it, it just it. I, I the only there's only one crypto token or currency that I'm involved in, and it's the Kinesis one, which is backed by physical silver, right, and physical gold. And so that's, uh, I just opened my account with Kinesis recently, and I have a few ounces in my account of what they call silver KAG, Kinesis fully allocated silver. So that's an interesting take on crypto that I think has, some, you know, for us silver gold believers or investors, that's something that I think has potential. But uh, we're getting a bit off topic on, on this stuff. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Ivan? Yeah, so John, what I know you said it, uh, you started uh, Silver Elephant because uh, you lost your portfolio, a huge part of your portfolio in the crash before. Can you dive a little bit deeper into that? What was the process when you started uh, the company? What was your feelings going through it? Because that must have been tough. Yeah, Evan, I was a bachelor in my early 30s. And back then, Jim, remember the Canadian dollar was trading at like, 30, like a US dollar is a, 30, a 30 Canadian. I was like, I was running like $20 million on my, by myself. I was, really, was like in high life. Um, and then when did see that 20 and chop the zero at 2009, so you can imagine. But, um, but I made it back quite quickly and, and, and um, it, it was just a way to salvage my own portfolio. I had invested over a hundred juniors um, you know, subscribe to the newsletters and uh, a lot of the same actors who's been around the last cycle, they're still around, they're here. So you wonder how expert are they, you know, having been, <laughs> been talking for so long. Um, and um, so I have that unique perspective, Ivan, of, of looking from an investor doing a lot of, of your audience and going through that process of, of a league of tables and calculating answers and drill holes <laughs> and all that. <laughs> And now running a company, see, see, a, see a completely different side of things and, and not only dealing with technical side and dealing with government and dealing with um, marketing and, uh, uh, and the legal side, financial side and, uh, and, and legal, financial and technical side and the fundraising side. So I have a bit of a different sort of perspective for all that. That's not being easy. Would I do it again? I don't think I like it too much. I don't really look back. I look forward. It's been an interesting process. Um, but I, I'm the largest shoulder of Silver Elephant, so I, I'm not in here to collect, you know, let, I'm not going to like a lot of the uh, guy, junior guys. I know a lot of them very well, and, and they've been running around for 20, 30 years, and, you know, they see this as a hobby, right? When the market's hot, they raise money, and then they drill a couple of holes. In the summertime, they play golf, and then <laughs> the cycle continues. Uh, this is not what Elephant is about. <laughs> we are We are aiming for... We're aiming for the elephant, and we're we're really on to you know discover something, and not doing this as a as a profession. Adam. So hopefully, answers the questions. Yes, that's a very good answer. Where do you see the next three to five years? What is your goals? Uh, we don't we set our objective quite clear. Uh, Ivan, I think that's highly well. You know what my goal? It never really pet <laughs> exactly every time you said it. <laughs> you know, I was like, John, year 2000, would you be running a company in 2010? Now we're in hell. 20, 2010, John, would you be doing the same thing 10 years from now? Are you crazy? So <laughs> would it be doing three years from now? I don't know. Uh, but I do know that we have some great, incredible, excellent assets in Silver mm -hmm. Elephant. And some are 
very advanced stage and some exploration stage. So I, I do like to see, the, see them to get developed to some sort of, you know, if it, is a, if it is an exploration asset, I like to see the limits of these exploration, like the potential of these assets. Mm -hmm. And if it's a permitted asset or on the verge of getting it permitted, if the metal prices are um, are compliant or they're sort of are in a, in a good spot, then we'll, I like to get through the exercise of raising, you know, 100, 200, 300 million dollars, put them into production. I think ones that were, I think if they were to come to fruition, I would say, you know, I hang my hats, right? 10 years, went through a bear market for 10 years, seeing the thick and thin of everything, seeing the different actors from all sides and uh, learn a lot of, learn a lot of different things where I'm from just running a .com of, of a, a guy sitting on the desk, white collar guy, doesn't know anything to, <laughs> to dealing with ministry level, dealing with, uh, vendors of grandpas or the government and assets and dealing with fundraising and dealing with shareholders and just all aspects of it. And I would say I probably have met on average a thousand people a year. So I've read met easily over 5,000 people in the span of 10 years related wow. to this industry. I think that's more than you know, it's more than I want to know more than I need to know. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I would just say it's not money always matters, but I think we're onto something quite special in the next eight, 24 months commodity market in the 10 years, usually eight years going sideways or seven year going sideways and one or two year going down and one year going up. Mm -hmm. So we're into that seventh inning, Ivan and Jim. This is where I see the silver market uh, in the seventh inning. And you want to, you want to go, uh, uh, leave uh, the movie. You don't want to exit the movie. The best part is always the last part. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I was talking about the crying game, right? You want to see whether Empire has closed. Even in 2011, silver went from 10 to 50 in the span of what? 12 months, same with dot com seeing 1999, NASDAQ went from 1500 to 5000 in six months. So the best part is yet to come, but there are some indicators of froth though in the market. So I'm not sure if, um, if silver is gonna do something it better do sooner or later. That's sort of where I'm at. That's a good answer. You know, a lot of a lot of people think we're, a lot of experts we've talked to, whether it's uh, Jim Rogers or uh, Willem Middlecoop or you know some of the other wonderful people we've had online, uh, that we're entering a commodity super cycle. And you, you said seventh inning, I would say second inning in terms of where we're going right now. And, but I'm looking at more the 2025 to 2030 timeframe in that time frame when I think shortages in silver are going to be far more pronounced. Um, sort of, so let's talk out to like that 200, 2030 timeframe. If supply keeps declining, and demand keeps increasing, you know, there's this 3 billion ounces that's above ground of silver that's in all the vaults around the world, whether it's London or Comex or those places. At some point, some of these markets break, like the palladium market broke a few years ago and true price discovery started occurring in the palladium market. And a lot of people in our community feel that we don't yet have pr true price discovery for the price of silver. It's manipulated too much. And I'm wondering if we start having this supply shortage with demand so strong, is there a breaking point? Is there a trigger where you think we might find true price discovery for silver? Well, I say price discovery is more a thing of the past, not only for silver, but the bonds, like you look at from 1980, from 16% 10 year, now it's trading at 1.5%, right? Mm -hmm. Who in the right mind would be lending money at 1.5%? Yeah. And then the equity market, who will buy Amazon at what, two, three trillion dollar market cap, whatever it is right now? Doesn't make any sense. Um, in, regarding the structure, sort of say, hey, when is that apocalypse moment? Well, Jim, remember in Ivan that back in what, 2011, there was the peak oil theory, right? Oh my God, oil is going to go to what? It's that 2007 water. Ari Spross talking about, oh, the oil is going to run. It was $150, going to go 300 and it's not a drop of oil. And oh, it went to negative. Yeah. <laughs> not even a year ago. Remember the theory about, oh my God, the world population is going to explode and uh, things going to go crazy. You're going to run out of food and... I think world population is probably going to be in the decline. Um, yeah, that's true. You said 2030. Jim, I'm not sure if the dollar is going to be around at 2030. I'm yeah, not sure what no. form oh the dollar God. is going to exist. Yeah. So 
I think for now, I will just say uh, we're a trading band. Of, like I said, whatever plan you said a year, like, you know, what, what plan you said in January that actually turned true by the end of the year. And we're living, our time is actually getting more and more compressed mm -hmm. than anything else. I mean, a, a perfect example, if you look at 2009, it took about 18 months for the, for the financial markets to recover from the financial crisis started 2009 and 2011 before the market recovered. And look at us, we're not even a year into the, into the hike of the pandemic and yet the market's already setting all time high. So um, things are gonna take faster to play out. And, and that's first. And secondly, I think right now the silver is uh, what I see a consolidation market between 200 day moving average, which is around 24. And um, I think a big resistance level would be 27 and a half. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked on the show, our Chris Arkini, a couple other interviews in Google Me on YouTube, um, that I, those, this is going to be the range bound for, um, in, in December, I said it's going to be range bound for at least a quarter. Now I see it's probably going on for two quarters until the end of June. And before, and after that, I don't have a call and I don't have a forecast for silver this year. Gotcha. Um, for a lot of for a lot of different reasons, uh, but right now uh, twenty seven. But the thing is, if it does get past twenty seven and a half, and not just like on a Friday or on a Monday morning, for one consecutive week end, end to end for five business days, then you're gonna see a very quick ascent past thirty. And once that once that happens, then it's really anybody's guess. I mean, Jim and Ivan, um, top is only in hindsight. I think when silver is 50, back in what, March or April 2011, it could go to 70, it could go to 100, right? You never know. Uh, it's only hindsight. So I think once you pass 30, then it will be a confluence events of where the dollar is, where the gold is, where the oil is. I mean, if, if gold is at 3,000, you say, well, 50, that's nothing. Gold, silver go to, <laughs> should go to 100. But if, 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 if it was, was like back in February when silver was almost 30, but gold was 1800 and not even taken on 1850, you say, hey, hang on a second, you know, maybe this is one off anomaly that you got to pay attention. So I think, I think right now the level you got to watch out for is 27 and a half. Uh, I'm a bit concerned about the general equity market and, 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 and just a lot of things like topping of interest rates. And, and I think the market's overheated and the, the, the banks, central banks might want to cool the market off a little bit, a little yeah. bit. So I'm a little bit concerned about the wobbly of the market and silver is what I call the greed trade. It's not a fear trade when there's things are, when, when, when stuff hit the fans, either it's geopolitics or financial crisis or equity correction or housing correction or another COVID whatnot, you know, silver is seeing right. The last, the last round of silver went to 11 or 10. So you don't want to be sticking around. You don't want to be sticking around when, when she hit the fans. Uh, it, there's a possibility it could, I'm not saying it will, so I don't have a forecast of silver, at least for, I think it's going to be range bound. And I think for the fundamental investors, now it's a good time to buy. Bottom is a 24. I don't think it's going to go below 24 unless something really nasty happens. It bounced quickly of 24.8 to now the 26. So it's very healthy. But whether it's going to take out 27 and a half in the imminent time horizon, it yet to remain to be seen. I think it's going to take some sort of catalyst event like the Reddit or or uh, some some other some other events. And then to watch out for is the PSLV is, you know, the volume trending down and summer is coming up. So all those things are, you know, if it's going to make a run at it, you better do it sooner than later. Mm -hmm. So can you guys see oh, the Oh, there you chart? go. Perfect. Uh, yes. Yeah, the the exactly silver chart about. up. Yes. And I think what you were talking what you 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 mentioned 2750 and I I, yes. I sort of feel this you're you're probably right there. Everyone seems to believe this heavy area around 2750 to 28 is a resistance area. Yes. I've sort of I sort of outlined where I think the trends of the of the bull flag pennant are right now. And if we get above, you know, 27, I th I think you're right. If we get above 28, people will start really getting excited and obviously then it's 30 is, you know, we we touched it back here 2991. And here, just 30.05, 30.06, we briefly got there and then came back down. We need some sustained action above 28, and I think this thing just launches higher. That's just yeah, my first. Yeah, go Absolutely. Ahead. And if you look at the 20, 30-year chart, uh, that should be more useful because, remember, silver is a billion-ounce market. It's a very tiny market, and, it, and give, any given day, the commercial can just dump a couple hundred thousand contracts, so you'll be down 7% on the day. 
and it might take a day, three days or two weeks or a month to recover. Uh, however, the key there is, Jim, as you said, I think once silver takes out $30, your investment strategy got to be a, a, a just, yeah. right? You'd be doing very well buying 24, selling at 27 and a half, but once it's 27 and a half, whatever you allocated to silver, I think you should go all in. Like one, like for me anyway, that, that whatever you allocated to silver, which is for me, anything outside of real estate, really, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, you know, that will be sit and watch, enjoy the show. And when I say take out, it would be 27 and a half for one full week consecutive for, for one, for one full week. So the gotcha. strategy will change for me. Well, you know, you, you mentioned a bit earlier, I want to go back to what you said about the U S dollar. Um, I know you live in Canada, but I'm sure you watch the dollar like everyone does. It's it's the world reserve currency. And you made the comment a few minutes ago, I'm not even sure if the dollar is going to be around 10 years from now. And strangely enough, a lot of people don't really, you know, in our lifetimes, it hasn't happened. But if you look back over the past 2000 years, every currency, paper currency has failed eventually. Um, the world reserve currency typically changes every hundred years. It, you know, it was the, the British pound before it was the U.S. dollar. Um, it's been other currencies. Uh, uh, are we? It seems like what the U.S. government's doing with the creation of trillions and trillions of dollars of you know unbacked currency to fund their debt, their twin deficits, the trade deficit, the government budget deficit. They seem like they're devaluing the dollar. And I wonder at some point, what's the next world reserve currency that replaces this? I mean, where do we go from here? Because we're approaching Greek debt crisis levels of debt in the United States. I'm you not know, sure. Jim, my view on that, uh, I look at things a little differently because the, the dollar hegemony is getting actually more prevalent, more uh, global scale than ever before. So if you look at, depending on how you measure percentage of dollar in circulation in the world economy actually grown, it's not shrunk. And, um, and then, so you're really looking at the dollars being printed to fill the global trend, uh, commerce, which is at 70, $80 trillion or maybe more mm -hmm. at a keep getting count. So if that's the case, uh, then, then the amount of, like you're printing what a trillion, two trillion a year, it's not a whole lot of, it's not a whole lot. So I wouldn't really look at it so much uh, the dollar printing for the U.S. economy per se, but but if you think about but you said how is this time different because the deficit has been running since since the U.S. become a net debtor from a net creditor since the eighties so it's been going on forty years so, so why now right why the next five years? Uh, you know, my gut feeling has got to do with the status of U.S. as being superpower. And I'm getting a little philosophical, maybe, but it, it is relevant because if you look at what makes the United States great um, in, in, its, in, its, in, its, in its infrastructure, and if you look at New York, the top four city in New York, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, right? You wouldn't dare walking. And they're ghost towns now. They're horrible. Yeah. Okay, so the infrastructure is in peril. And then if you look at um, the freedom, I mean, do you feel freer now than you were before? No, uh, I, live, in, I live in Florida, Florida, so I am free in Florida. Right. We don't have any right. <laughs> but, but I'm not, I'm, I'm talking judicial, legislative, and, yeah. um, and the executive, right? So, so, so a lot of the legal financial framework to make America strong is getting eroded rapidly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, you know, U.S. stock market is still the greatest on earth. Well, do they really plead allegiance to the United States and U.S. dollar? Well, no, I'm not sure, because if you look at Facebook and Twitter, they're openly talking about creating their own crypto stable currencies. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they're, they plead allegiance to nobody. They're a monster, they, are, they are economies of their own. Then if you were to take out the, 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 the if you take out the, the, uh, you know, what do you call these Amazons, the, the Apples, the, the five, right? Uh, out, out of the S&P 500, the then what sucks. is left of yeah. S&P 500? I mean, they account for something like 50 or 40% of the, all of like the top 10 companies. So if they, if they are a piece of their own, then, 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 the, then if you look at the militaries, well, I mean, that's another thing, right? Uh, now you're looking at, you know, everybody's busy with LGBTQI, whatever they are. Um, and the uh, the military is a, is a shadow of its former self. 
And it seems to me that it, it was go to the whoever the highest bidder. So I, I, I'm just not sure. So, I, you know, I'm bearish of the dollar, not from the deficit per se, but the mm. dollar hegemony as a global currency is at, st- is in, is, is at stake. And, and there's a lot of actors that are surely want to replace that because who, who wouldn't, right? Any other country would try to experiment this deficit spending would have gone in, in smoke long ago and everybody want to be that. And, and in, including the in, uh, International Monetary Fund who's issuing these, uh, what do you call the- SDRs. Uh, international drawing rights, right? Yeah, uh, SDRs. I, SDRs. And that's been, that town has been going for a while, for about 20 years. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and then if you look at the consolidation of, um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of guys that are circling. It's like a shark circling around. And I'm just, you know, I'm not sure who's in charge right now in the U.S. to see that or if they even care. Yeah, I wonder who's in charge also because, uh, <laughs> you know, Biden seems like a nice guy. I wonder whether he's got early stage dementia personally. But uh, um, politics aside, but the dollar, but the point is the dollar is in peril, not because it's deficit. I think it's it's more that that status as reserve currency is challenged. Wow. Yeah. Um, in many forms. I don't know but, how what to come out of it. And you know what? If there's not active managing of gold and silver, I think dollar would have been in, 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 in trouble a long time ago. And I don't think there's any secret in the management of the gold and silver, just like any other market. John, yeah. your, your knowledge is immense. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, you're, 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 it's very, you got, you got a very good perspective on these things. Yeah. And it's not what, yeah, I, I, I'm liking this. Um, what is, uh, Ivan, do you, your next question? Yeah, so we're talking about cryptos, John. Do you think the Federal Reserve will come out with their own crypto, outlaw the rest of cryptos, and that will be the new currency? A digital yeah, the currency. digital dollar or, or the digital euro. Mm-hmm. Well, it's an absolute interest of the central banks to do that because they can track wherever you are. And mm-hmm. if you happen to be somebody they don't like, they can turn the tap off and then you're in no man's land. So they're getting rid of... Let's do this, Jen, look. If you open a bank account with, say, uh, a local union bank, and that will be rolled up to, say, one of the top five, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and that will be rolled up to the Fed, right? So you stay anonymous in some form unless somebody is really looking for you. But in the forms of a crypto, they will know they will know your they will know everything that you own. They can turn the tap off whenever they want. So it's absolutely in central bank's interest to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, the cryptos has gone for so long without, you know, it makes me wonder, right? The cryptos, I mean, the Fed could easily outlaw that and, and drive that to the ground. They haven't. So I'm wondering if, if some of the guys above are actually active participants mm. of these crypto currencies, which is great. It's anonymous. It's outside of the banking system. Uh, US used, and, uh, you know, with all this anti-money launder laws and, 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 and fewer and fewer places are available to... To, to, to start your savings. Like for example, if you're a United States citizen, you cannot open a bank account in Hong Kong. Mm. In fact, oh, wow. I opened a bank account and I need two pieces of ID and I was in a hurry jetting off the airport. It was a couple of years ago. And uh, I gave my pa- passport and which is non-US, but I need a second form of ID, which I don't have. And I gave them my US driver's license, okay? And my account was open reluctantly, but a week later it got shut down for no reason. What? So um, oh, yes, I'm just saying that there is a lot of appeal for cryptos for for other reasons, and and I will I wouldn't be surprised the reason they last for so long because uh, the, the 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 higher ups are active participants of of these cryptocurrencies. <laughs> we are seeing a lot of in investment banks now coming out with crypto oriented products, so that that leads me to believe that the powers that be are not going to shut down Bitcoin or anything else simply because the big banks are already are getting on board. The hedge funds are getting on board. So there'll be too much political pressure to allow the cryptos to continue. Um, it's anyways, it seems like they've reached that level of power at this point. Uh, just my personal opinion. Um, yeah, Ivan, uh, yeah so john uh we were talking about cryptos we're talking about your career how it started silver elephant uh the the original name is silver elephant when you started it correct no the original i took over a company the company is this prophecy so uh, uh that's what it was called it's kind of an interesting cliche and then you know it's it, it's very 
funny. Well, not funny, but it's interesting in a way that as time go by, we're getting a lot of pushback of, of the name because it's got some Christian association to it. Uh -huh. So then we, uh, I changed the name to Silver Elephant in March 20, uh, 2020 because I see a silver rise. And we've been pretty good in timing getting into acquisition, property acquisition, underlying metals about to enter in the commodity bull market. So silver was about 12 at the, 12 at the time. $12 at the time. And uh, since then, you know, it's more than doubled. And we're actually taking the opportunity last year, this is our business year for, for the company. We've acquired three silver, uh, we have acquired two silver gold projects. So we have, nice. not, have not only one, but we have three. And we've raised over $15 million uh, last year. And uh, we raised over $30 million since the commodity bear correction ended in 2017. Wow. Well, it's incredible, so are, John. Are you, are you, what, is there a point uh, later this year that you want to get back in touch with us for drill results or what's your next steps with your silver elephant project? We made a discovery and oh. uh, our flagship project had a 20 million, 120 million ounces. It was a past producer underground, very high grade, 1000 grams per ton. Oh. So we turned that into an open pit and we drilled and we, uh, and uh, there's 120 million ounces of silver grading at about 70 grams and 3% of that in zinc. So at today price is, it's not too. It's not too bad, especially for open pit. And then uh, last year, last September, we acquired the project, uh, 60 square kilometers, and uh, we did some sampling, 950 samples. We took we're pretty aggressive in what we do. We're Uber, sort of, you know, just getting things done. And 87% returned uh, assay uh, silver gra uh, grays on surface. And we started drilling in December, and we announced 10 drill holes. All 10 hit silver. Wow. And uh, some mineralizations were 150 meters, but they're about lower, lower, lower grade, about 30, 40 grams per ton. But we was announced results yesterday or on, Tuesday, on Wednesday, well, time flies. <laughs> and then we're getting a uh, grades up to seven, 800 grams per ton and getting up to 7% zinc. L, but the intercept the width intervals are a little narrower. But hey, look, it's, you know, it's a three kilometer stretch. We put 15 holes at 300 meters spacing. I mean, 300 meters enough for you to have a mega deposit, right? Yeah. So I think we're, we're shopping, we're getting a lot of needles, not exactly what we're looking for exactly, but I think we're highly encouraged and we have another uh, six holes to come. And we think the best part is yet to come. The reason we didn't cherry pick the best hole to start, we actually picked the worst hole to start because of logistical issues. We started mm -hmm. from a higher altitude drilling into the valley is where the higher grade are from historical workings. So we're pretty we're pretty excited about that project. But you know, even if the result didn't pan out, we still have that flagship project that we started with. So it provides a good diversified approach to uh, to uh, our to our shareholder base and to our mandate. And um, last year we started 50 million ounces. We grew up that to 100, and now we're at 100. We hope to get to 200 before yeah. the end of the year. At, at what price of silver do you believe that this these projects might be viable? What what price do you need of silver to yeah you to know what, make Jim, economical? And, uh, Ivan the standard cookie cutter template that's do that's drill and then do a PEA do a feasibility pre fees and fees and all that. My point of view on that is I've seen enough projects. Um, we will attend to those matters when silver is what we believe twenty percent from the top. Mm -hmm. And right now we're about thirty percent from the bottom. Like I said, we're at the seventh inning right now. Gotcha. Whatever studies you do, and, and we will do we will take the time to do those studies when we really genuinely want to put the mind new production. But when we do that, Jim and Ivan, is when the project is like a no-brainer. It's like a two-year payback. It's like even a you know, not a monkey can do, but even the you know, it's it's like a no-brainer. It's like one it's it's just no-brainer. And so for projects, for any projects like that, for all these projects we're looking at in the junior sector, I think you're gonna take a fifty dollar silver. To really yeah. make all this project a no-brainer. Oh yes, not, a lot of uh, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, look at all the studies, right? They're done like on a five percent MP on a five percent cost of capital. I mean, who can who's junior can go out there raise money at five percent cost of capital, like more than twenty five percent, and uh, throwing Warren the contingencies and the COVID delays, and then the uh, royalty and tax issues, like the first majestic is a, is experiencing, and all those things happening. Was I would say, wait, well, hey, look. I'm the largest shareholder. If I can put an asset into production and risk putting the lien and, and having project taken by the bank or the government or the communities. And once you start the project, you cannot stop. This community is going to hold you to it, right? All the whatever you sign. So it's very capital intensive, labor intensive, high risk to remind production. 
let's put the studies on hold until it become really is a no brainer. Yeah, a higher right? plateau not, for silver prices. Yeah, I we're understand. not dicking over an IRR of 22 versus 27 or 50 grand over 60. I mean, all of this is very pedantic, my point of view. So right now our focus, we'll have night geologists on the ground. We're drilling. Every day we think about is how can we add ounces and also how can we de-risk the project? Mm -hmm. Are there blind spots, right? Are there handicapped, which are not, which are, which will render the project not, not economic, but just cannot be commissioned. Like for example, if you have a lake or national park, you have a shrine or you have a metallurgical problem, right? You have a community problem or you got some, you know, country that's going through hyperinflation, whatever this. So we want to identify early on, on those issues and resolve them. And then so that in the end, all it matters is the silver price and nothing else. And that's what we're doing, Jim. So our mandate is we have night geologists. Every day we think about is, first of all, are these projects, can these projects be developed, right? If, if not, then there's no exit strategy. And so, and if so, then, you know, how can we package the project so, so that when, when the mating season starts, say 50 or $70 silver or 100, that will also depend on the macro factors that, that then we can put the company on, we, we either raise the money if the capital market is conducive for us to do that, we hire the right management, the makeup of the company will be very, very different. Or we, we will, uh, JD, I'll get a royalty and whatnot, or sell it, whatever it, what they are. Um, I don't think anybody called a $30 silver price this time last year. So who the hell knows when it's going to happen. But um, no, we just have to go by. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Jim, the answer to your question is, well, what price are these assets economic? I says, I don't know. But I, would certainly, I wouldn't even spend the time and the money to study them. At least silver is 20% on the top. So yeah. what is 20% yeah. on the top? I say... I say, you know, like gold is, it's got to be at least 3,000, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, uh, and oil is at 100, and then let's see where silver is at the time. Well, Understood. John, you have been an incredible, incredible guest for Wall Street Silver community. We really, really appreciate you. Jim, do you have any more questions for John? No, no, this has been really fascinating to listen to, your perspective on a lot of things. Uh, you, you have a different point of view that yeah. I haven't heard from some of our other guests, and this was really interesting, John, and would love to have you back sometime in the future to talk with you some more. Yeah, Jim, a couple of minutes, a couple of things. First of all, you can get hold of me on uh, John Lee Silver Elephant. Just Google us. Uh, I'm a very active at Twitter. I used to write, I've authored hundreds of articles and spoke at all the conferences you can think of, but I just don't have time to do that for the last 10 years. So I, I mm. tweet instead. It's easier. We're going to include a link to your Twitter in our, the description exactly, of this video. Uh, Jim, I, I, I used to visit New York, not, not too much, but only for marketing. And I recall 2011, I go to the diner, get a breakfast for 20 bucks. Last night I did that in New York in 2018, right, 19 before the pandemic was $60. Wow. Okay. Wow. So it's, it's good exercise for you to get a coin. This is what I say. This is what I do. I encourage people. Get an uh, a eagle, an eagle, put it in your pocket, okay? And so as you do shopping, you say, hey, look, how like, you know, would I trade my coin, right, for that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't trade an eagle for breakfast. No. So that tells you your, your ego is undervalued, right? Yeah. So the $25 today is a different problem was 10 years ago. And then the other point here I want to drive at is I think the Fed and central banks and the, the financial markets are looking at just a cautionary tale because the volume has been decreasing. The volatility is increasing like we've never seen before in the last four years. And uh, the 10 year is at one point is 1.6%. It's broken out of, you know, three year high. And um, the equity market is wobbly and uh, oil is at $60. The last thing you want is to have the yield increase, continue to go up while commodities continue to go up. That is a very big problem because that's inflation and, and, and yet you cannot raise further interest rate. That would be a very difficult problem to solve. So the only way to put, kind of put the genie back in the model to have the bids for the treasury to lower the interest rate is what you can buy the treasury notes like the Fed has been doing. But I would not be surprised of an engineered equity watershed event or some sort of a global scare, whether geopolitics or financial markets. So that they could try to put the genie back to the uh, bottle to get the oil back to in the 40s, try to have a breather for the metals market to try to lower, try to put the interest rate back in its proper place below 1% and uh, have equity market take a breather. So I would not be surprised at that. And if that were to happen, gold is probably going to fare okay, but silver is going to be choppy. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I don't have a call on silver in the next three months. I don't, I, I can't assign the probability, but that probability of a correction is increasing by the day. 
and yeah. uh, it's looking sort of a of, of an so the, the 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 backdrop of silver is not as bullish it was back in say July when I made the call of thirty when silver is eighteen dollars because the election was coming everything's imminent they have a rosy picture every, everything's all the tabs are on <laughs> open everything's good but now things are very very different very very different so I would just say be cautious this is not the time to go all in it's going to consolidate twenty four to twenty seven and a half if you're going to go all in wait for one full week of twenty seven and a half before you do that. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Well, um, thank you so much, John. You you've been incredible, man. You your knowledge is awesome. Like that was I learned so much just by listening to you right there, Jim. That was incredible. Yeah, let's do it again. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Check us out. E L E F. It's the trading symbol. O T C is S I L E F. We are OTC 50, so we're the top 50 volume over the counter. Nice. And I think we're probably the smallest market cap to achieve that, partly because we had a legacy pass. So sometimes you show the wallet, price got out of sale, not to not knowing that silver has changed. And also we have four other projects. So look forward to provide update and chat again very soon, Jim. And Ivan, thank uh, you for the invitation. Awesome. I'll, put, I'll, put, I'll put the links to your social media and your, your company website in the description of the video. Thank you awesome. very much, John. We appreciate awesome. it. Thank Stay you, everyone. Thank you, John.